Well, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you might be. And welcome on behalf of Harif, the UK Association of Jews from the Middle East and North Africa. My name is Lynn Julius, and I'm assisted here by our technical whiz, Lawrence. Um, and uh, we've been running these Zoom lectures since the beginning of the pandemic. And since uh, it's such a good idea, uh, we've carried on doing so. And we really do have a global audience. Uh, for those who are new to Harif, uh, we are a very small band of volunteers. And our mission is to raise awareness of the Jews uh, from the Middle East and North Africa, awareness of their history and their culture. Uh, we do have a website, it's www.harif.org. And uh, in order to be informed of our Zoom events, you need to be subscribed. Um, we also have a sister website which keeps, keeps you up to date uh, with the news. It's called Point of No Return. It's updated every day and you can access it by clicking on news on the Harif website. And it has over 6,000 posts on Jews from Arab and Muslim countries. This session is being recorded uh, and the video will be up, we hope, within a few hours. And you can see it on the Harif uh, video channel. Uh, just click on videos on the Harif website. And we're also live streaming to the Harif Facebook page. If you have any questions for our speakers or any comments, please do type them in the chat. I'm afraid I have to keep you all muted for most of this session because there are uh, almost 150 of you out there. Uh, so it will be easier to manage. Yeah, and, and please, yeah. if you want to say something, do it in the chat, because if you raise yeah. your hand with 150 <laughs> little pictures to look at, I probably won't see it. Okay, so please do type your question or comment in the chat. Uh, so, our topic tonight is uh, Jews of Japan. Um, I think most of you are familiar with the Sassoons and that vast trading network that they set up across from India into the Far East. Um, and we've also been exploring here at Harif uh, lesser known communities, like for instance, Jews in Indonesia, uh, Jews in Borneo, uh, but um, Jews also settled in Japan. Uh, now, there have been Jews in Japan since the 16th century, Ashkenazim as well as Sephardim. Uh, in the 20th century, Kobe had the largest Jewish community. And of course, since we are the uh, Association of Jews from the Middle East, and North Africa, our main focus tonight is on the Baghdadi families from Iraq and Syria who settled in Kobe and uh, their experience during and after World War II. So uh, we are very fortunate to have joining with us uh, from New York, S. David Moshe, who was born in Kobe, and Rachel Wahba, who joins us from California, and she grew up in Kobe. And they will both share with us their memories and their stories. Uh, David Moshi uh, has a special interest in uh, the history of Jewish Kobe. Um, he was born there, he was educated at uh, an all-boys Catholic school and then a missionary school. When he graduated, he came straight to New York and Yeshiva University. What a culture shock was that? Uh, he studied accounting and has had a varied professional career 
uh, as a CPA businessman running the family import export business in Japan, in Kobe. He's been a banker, a currency trader, and an investor in Israeli high tech companies. And he worked at Republic National Bank. He's also been in London for a short time. And today he does live in New York with his wife and two wonderful daughters. So without further ado, I will hand over to David, who will give us an overview of the history of the Jews of Japan. Over to you, David. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Lynn. Um, if we can go to the slide, uh, we can show quickly the slide of uh, Japan. And uh, and I'll, I'm not going to read through the slide. I'll just provide a lot of this information just because I have it handy. And some of you might uh, want to know what some of the key dates are for uh, that affected the Jews in uh, in Japan. In this slide, the most important date, obviously, is the uh, and the most important piece of information is the uh, information that uh, the uh, firm of Kuhn Loeb and Jacob Schiff funded Japan in their war against Russia back in 1904-05, and that I think is also led to the obsession uh, of the Japanese with the Jews. Um, the most interesting thing that I saw that is actually a piece of information is a uh, an English language uh, newspaper that mentioned that on Sunday, December 4th in 1870, at the synagogue in Kobe, Reverend Getlinger uh, uh, and Gaston Blass of Kobe to Sophia, daughter of Michael Blass, he married uh, from Memphis, Tennessee. He married them off. That's the first English record that I have of Jews in Kobe, Japan. The rest of the story is really the story of my father and how he got there. You'll see that he had he came from Baghdad, Iraq in 1936. He was a young man, um, came to Japan. He was working at a bank. I'll make this really fast because this is not so much the history of Kobe, but he was working at a bank. One of the clients of the bank came to him and said, how would you like to go to Japan and replace my son there? The son's name was David Simon. <clears throat> my father said, yes, yeah, sure, I'd like to go. Got on the plane, got to Japan. He, well, I'm sorry, got on a boat, went to Japan and uh, started his uh, business career in Japan as an agent for the Baghdadi firm of uh, Simon. Uh, it was called, he was called Abu Timmen at the time, Howie Abu Timmen. Anyway, so my father, my father got to Japan. He had an option uh, when the war was about to start to leave Japan, he decided to stay. His brother went to, to Bangkok. Uh, the rest of his family, there were six, uh, there were seven children, five of them remained in Baghdad for the next several years. They had no contact with with each other. Um, I go, I'll jump quickly forward to what happened during the war and how the uh, community in Kobe expanded. So prior to the war, there was a large Eskenazi population. There were uh, traders, there were representatives of watch companies, uh, Swiss watch companies, for example. They had retail shops where they sold uh, merchandise. Um, and the Middle Eastern Jews, or I'll refer to them here as Mizrahi Jews, were primarily agents. They were agents for textile companies uh, for the most part and anything else that uh, they could send back to their home country. And usually in those cases, it was either back to Baghdad or to England or to Italy. Um, the most significant event for the Jews, so that was the core of the community in Kobe. What the most significant event for the Jews during World War II was uh, uh, Chiyune Sugihara. He and um, his uh, fellow consul of the, uh, from Holland, uh, arranged for effectively 2,345 visas to Corsa. You can move that slide forward, Lawrence, if you yeah, want. Right. No, it's waiting for you to, your guidance. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, you can give. So we're at the visas for life. So uh, Sugihara wanted to help the Jews who were standing at the gate of his consulate, but he didn't have any authority to do anything. 
and there was one very enterprising well there were there were everybody at that time was very enterprising trying to find how to get out of Lithuania Poland uh, and the whole region and they were exploring every possible alternative so there was this one Dutch lady actually who found out that from the Dutch consul that if they uh, got a stamp that said no visa required for Curacao they can at least get to Curacao, but they needed to know how to get uh, through some transit country. And they had approached and were getting information. This is all happening over the period of several months. Uh, they had approached the Japanese consulate and he said, look, I can't give you a visa, a visa unless you show me that you're going someplace. So you have to have a destination visa. So of course, the, they put it together and they said, well, I, I don't need a destination visa for Curacao. You can give me a transit visa for Japan. And that's how, effectively how he got around that rule. As you probably know, they both, they each suffered in their home country for overstepping their authority. But it was, uh, and they were both recognized in Israel, obviously, as righteous among the nations. Um, one other significant and really very special, when they landed, obviously, they needed, they needed money and they needed housing. They needed a room and board. They needed to know where, what their next step was. Many of them didn't leave with very much. So uh, there, were, there was an international committee set up in Kobe at the time called JUCOM. Uh, many of you might have heard of it. The very significant players at in Jucom later on became <clears throat> became important uh, businessmen in the United States. Uh, the telegram that went from the American Joint Distribution Committee to Jucom, "Save Jews, money no object," is a historic is a historic one. It went for auction. Uh, about several years ago. I don't know exactly who owns it now. Um, the next slide is uh, just uh, a slide that shows the entrance for the JUCOM office. If we had expanded that or more pictures, you could see hundreds of people in the little alleyways of Kobe um, uh, waiting to get more information about uh, about what their situation was in Kobe and when they would be able to get out and, and move on. Um, the next slide is uh, uh, local, no, not that one yet, uh, is a local uh, Jack Shweke. Uh, the Shweke family are uh, our historic Kobe family. They came in the 1930s from Aleppo. Uh, Lucy Shweke sitting on the bottom right, the grand dame of uh, the Jewish community of Kobe just died a few years ago at the age of 104. She was, uh, I guess, the equivalent of my godmother, any any young woman married to a, a, a Mizrahi gentleman went back to the home country to get married and then come back to Japan, always stopped in with Lucy Shweke to introduce his new wife uh, because Lucy would be there at the birth of any of the children. Um, I go to the next slide. So I prepared a, um, I had a little free time. So I had a, I prepared a blog where um, I interviewed uh, former residents of Kobe, uh, old time residents, and tried to get a history with my main objective was to see when the first Sefer Torah came to Kobe. And um, I called all the people that I knew and I tracked down people obviously that I some I didn't know, I introduced myself and I had a young assistant Lisa who transcribed all these. So I, I put all the information up on uh, on the website, uh, not in any particular uh, book form or monograph, but just the notes. And um, we called it, it's just a blog. Uh, it's not even a, a real website. It was called the uh, history of Jewish Kobe Japan, one word. And um, over the years, I've had extremely, it was very quiet in the early years that it was up on the internet. But then, uh, then for some reason or other, that it, uh, it steamrolled and we had Lots of interest, people making comments, people sending information and so on. So this picture that you're looking at is the story of a gentleman who was a writer for the Asahi Shimbun, a Japanese newspaper. So he writes to me and he says, this is very strange. My boss pictured in the picture over here used to be a uh, bursar on a boat that went from Vladivostok to J Tsuruga, Japan on the West Coast. He had collected, not collected, he had been given from these seven individuals pictured in that card, 
their photos. Some of them had inscribed, you know, uh, best wishes and their names. Some said, oh, we don't know where we're going, but please tell people about me. Don't forget us, that sort of thing. The gentleman never did anything with it. So, but he did give it to his, uh, his uh, young colleague, uh, Kitade, who had reached out to me. And he said, look, I have this manifest. I have all these pictures. I don't know what to do with them. So at the time that he had called me, the Holocaust Museum was just being completed, uh, had just been completed in Washington, D.C. I suggested, well, send it to the Holocaust Museum. And I said, you know what? Why don't you just send it to Yad Vashem? It's a great repository of all kinds of information about the Holocaust. So um, he did do that. Um, several years later, I get a call from the uh, Japanese ambassador to uh, New York. And he says, Moshe-san, we're having a party. Your friend Kitade is coming over here. I said, oh, what happened? He said, well, it seems that there was a woman scrolling through the Yad Vashem website, sees one of these pictures and says, oh, that's my aunt. So uh, we put them all, we put them together and there's going to be official physical handoff of the photo from Kitade to the family member. And that was one of those interesting stories that came came out of uh, the blog. Another one, can you scroll next, uh, Lawrence? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway, so that the war years were uh, not difficult. Well, there were of course difficult years, but as you see from the slide, the a lot of the local residents, the permanent residents, moved up to the mountains. Um, there were kind, there were very kind Japanese throughout uh, the period of the war, who helped get uh, the Jews get food and so on. Also, the Jews had uh, textiles and and goods in warehouses that they could barter for food in the in the countryside. And that's one of the things that my father father did. Um, uh, just a story about the Japanese security officer Osakabe. He was assigned to watch the Jews of Kobe. And um, the reason we learned about him is that my father, every January 1st, which is an important new year, which is an important date for the Japanese, they're it's an international new year, but it's a very special week for them. And we would, uh, he would give us a bottle of whiskey and wrap it up very nicely. And he said, go, go take it up to a certain apartment in an apartment complex next door. And uh, we would do that. We never know, we never who knew who the gentleman was, but the apartment complex was owned by a friend of ours, uh, Jamal family, original from Lebanon, but then Milan and Italy. And when they arrived to Kobe, when the next generation of Jamals arrived to Kobe to look over their properties, they real they saw this this gentleman had an apartment in one of their in their one of their buildings, and he had never paid rent. So they called up uh, another part-time uh, permanent resident, Rahmu Sassoon, they said, uh, Rahmu, what's going on over here? There's this guy, he's living over there, no rent, no nothing in all these years. And he said, well, he's, that's Mr. Osakabe. He helped us during the war. And they said, well, and then of course they, they found another place for him uh, because they uh, tore down the building to, to do something else with it. But that's uh, one of the, one of the bright stories of uh, the Japanese being kind to the uh, residents of Japan um, uh, during the war, which leads us to the uh, temporary refugees that came in, the, the uh, refugees that had um, Sugihara visas, and there were, besides those 2,000 plus, there were close to another uh, 1,500 who had different kind of visas that were some com coming into Kobe. And um, so this displaced Jews is the name of an exhibit that was uh, that was set up and curated at the Hyogo Prefectural Museum. The new curator of the museum wrote to me uh, as a result of this blog that I'd mentioned earlier, and he said, "Oh, my name is uh, such and such. I um, I'm the new curator." I went downstairs to the basement and I was looking through all some of the boxes uh, of uh, from some of the old exhibits, and I came across this uh, this box. It was called it was it was called Displaced Jews, and it was photos of an Osaka photo hobby club. They came to Kobe 
to take pictures of in, these individuals. I mean, obviously, this is just a few pictures that we put together here on the, on this PowerPoint slide, but it's a catalog of of European Jews um, in all in, you know in any of many of their activities during the course of a day. And when you think about it, they were only really there for a few months because many of them had to stay for two weeks. It was only a two week visa. It was after all, it was a transit visa. So they had to leave. Many of them couldn't leave. They got extensions to stay a little bit longer. That's another story. Eventually, all these refugees uh, were sent to uh, this, the foreign settlement in Shanghai where they spent the rest of the war. Uh, the next slide again is another picture of uh Japanese I mean I'm sorry the displaced persons the refugees milling about in the alleyway the the slide after that is a very interesting slide this this exists this photo existed but a few years ago the Japanese government and especially the Kobe municipality wanted to show the world uh there was a little bit of anti-Japanese sentiment in the world regarding uh contributions to world peace and so on so the Japanese government got behind an effort to disclose to the world the things that they did that were not terrible you know not you know not to uh, not some of the uh, POW camp atrocities and so on. So this is a picture of the Jewish refugees milling around an apple cart that was brought in from the countryside. And the Kobe municipality used this as an example of how the residents uh, supported the refugees in every way they could. And the truth is, is that they did. Um, the police, there's there is some interesting stories about how the police let the uh, refugees mill about uh, wherever you want. You know, Japan is a very orderly, structured uh, country. Um, they, they didn't go around checking identification the way they normally did and were generally kind to the, uh, to the refugees. Um, I don't know how much time I have left, but I'll I'll show the other picture is just refugees, some happy, some less happy, uh, waiting for whatever news they could uh, have about what their next step in in their journey journey was. Post World War II, anyway. Um, uh, the um, uh, just to let one last thing about Osakabe, he was kind enough to warn the Jewish community that there was something brewing that they might be shipped out at the time close to what ended up being the end of the war out of Kobe. Um, there was a little bit of concern where they were going to do that and what was going to happen. Um, but uh, luckily um, for the Jewish community, uh, they were they were able to stay in Kobe till the end of the war, and uh, with none, nothing uh, nothing tragic happening. Um, some interesting post World War II things to worry to concern uh, to think about. What happened with uh, circumcisions that uh, the boy, to the boys born during the war? Well, there was a Lieutenant Jacob Schachter who was with the uh, U.S. Army. Uh, he came, uh, he was stationed in uh, Shoya just outside Kobe. He used to come to the synagogue all the time when he heard there were these two young boys, roughly four and six years old, um, without uh, not being circumcised. Uh, he, through his connections, he called, they found a British chaplain in Singapore who flew up and uh, was able to circumcise the uh, boys. The other comment I have over here is, uh, a lot of the Ashkenazi Jews uh, left at that point. Um, the old time Israeli residents stayed. They raised their families. And when their children reached college age, obviously they all left. Japanese for Israel, probably one of the most important uh, movements, the Makoya, who are true lovers of Israel, uh, taking multiple trips and having hundreds, if not thousands, of events over the years. Uh, supporting Israel and supporting the Jewish community. Before you get to that, the synagogue was rebuilt in 1970 at the same location where the uh, furniture warehouse was. That was the original synagogue. And um, uh, Mr. Albert Hamway, who was uh, taught me by bar mitzvah, and my father 
um, shared a lot of the work in terms of managing the rebuilding of the synagogue, which today you will see in the picture following um, uh, after a picture of our, our family. So just so that you know, when a Japanese uh, proprietor of a store saw the group of people coming like that into his store, two things would happen. Either he would go crazy and shut his doors or he'd have a big smile on his face. So uh, finally, the picture of the synagogue I told you about, you see the beautiful chairs. Um, over the years, uh, as the old time residents uh, moved on or <clears throat> to and left Kobe, um, there were there were young single men, many from Israel, many from around the world, either there to uh, study local Japanese martial arts or or teach English or whatever. And one of them uh, found out that the movie theaters in Japan changed their seats every two, three years. And uh, they went to the to, they went to the management and they said, "Hey, look! If you, if it's no big deal to you, we'll take them off your hands." So every few years, the synagogue has a whole new set of movie theater to seats in the synagogue, quite comfortable and so on. As you can see, the uh, the design of the synagogue was was um, based on an architect, a Japanese architect's trip, uh, primarily to uh, New York. He visited uh, Shaare Tzion uh, Synagogue in Brooklyn and some other synagogues and came back and, uh, and designed the uh, synagogue in Kobe. Um, that's about all I have to say for now. Um, I, there's a little bibliography over here, the, uh, my blog, uh, Womb of Diamonds, a wonderful book written by Ezra Shweke, the grandson of Lucy Shweke about his grandmother, written, researched over seven years wonderful stories and a lot of information given by a woman who was uh had a clear mind and a clear head until the uh, the day she died and of course the famous fugu plan written by rabbi myvern took care which uh which gives a lot of background on the uh japanese motives uh in the early years of the war and how they tried to get uh New York investment banks and New York Jews to fund their World War II effort and by offering Jews sanctuary in Manchuria. But then that's only one of those side stories. Then, uh, so I thank you very much for listening and I hope you, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask away in the chat. Well, thank you so much, David. That was a, a, a fantastic, um overview of the history um, and some lovely little stories. Um, just a reminder to those of you who want to ask questions, please do type them in the chat. Uh, unfortunately, we have to keep you uh, muted for the duration. Anyway, so now we will go over to Rachel, Rachel Wachba, who actually was brought up in, uh, in Kobe. Uh, she's joining us from California, and uh, she's a writer, a psychotherapist, deeply informed by her experience of anti-Semitism. She's an Egyptian Iraqi Jew born in India, and she grew up stateless in Japan. And you can find her work online, uh, including uh, the blogs at the Times of Israel. And we do also feature her blogs from time to time on Point of No Return, our sister website. Uh, and she has actually not mentioned her wonderful advocacy work that she does for Jimena, which is Jews indigenous to the Middle East and North Africa, our sister organization in California. Uh, she does absolutely wonderful work. So without further ado, over to you, Rachel. Please tell us how it was to actually live in Japan. Yeah, it was a mixed bag. So thank you, Lynn. Um, and thank you, Lawrence and uh, David. Uh, David's four years younger than me. So he was, and we grew up together like the entire time in Japan. So I arrived in Japan in 1950. And that's the year David was born. 
and um, his older sister and I actually went to school together. Um, she was younger than me, so smaller grade. But at any rate, I'm going to center my talk on being stateless because it affected every aspect, every choice my family made um, in the time we were there. So I was born in India. And when I was four and a half, moved to Japan. Um, I was already stateless when we got to Japan. So it was a harrowing journey actually for my mom because dad left on his Egyptian passport. And maybe, oh yeah, I am doing the power play here. No, the, the PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> power play, okay. Um, so here we go. Um, so these are my um, parents' passports, and they were, my mother's was already annulled by 1949 from Baghdad, and she, her family, just very quickly, her family left Baghdad uh, uh, two years after the Farhud, long story, but on her mother's British passport, because she was an Iraqi Jew from Singapore. So you know, just as you've seen from other Harif programs, we were all over the far and the far east. So at any rate, this passport was useless, could not get us to Japan. My father's passport got him to Japan from India and where he was actually waiting out the war. So this is so complicated, it even confuses me. So my dad left Egypt in 1939, went to Japan, from Japan, went to Shanghai in like 41. And then he knew war was gonna break out, got to India. My mother's family had left after the Farhud. So they, it took them two years to get out of Iraq. And so in 43, the Farhud was 41, 43, they went to India, parents met, got married, the Egyptian and the Iraqi, which was actually an issue then because Iraqis married Iraqis. And uh, but dad was Egyptian and apparently made, uh, he was okay with my mother's father. They got married, had me. And then when India got um, independence, it was too hard for a small businessman like my father to make a living in India with import export. Went back to Japan in 1950, actually a little bit before 1950, took my mother and myself and my six month old brother um, exactly a year to get out of India to join my father in Japan because we were considered stateless. So, Dad's passport, even though it was active still, and Egypt had not yet canceled Jewish passports, was not usable for my mother and I. And the Indian consulate said, we can't do anything for you. You're not Indian, and you marry to an Egyptian, go to the Egyptian consulate. Egyptian consulate, Musa Wafa is no longer, pretty soon he's not going to be an Egyptian. And the Iraqi said, you married an Egyptian, go to the Egyptian consulate. Red Cross said, you're not refugees, we can't help you. One year, exactly one year. So we get to Japan, join my father in 1950. And, and as you can see on the, the Egyptian pass, my dad's Egyptian passport, I had a passport for what? Two years, because that's me. And I'm probably about two years old. Okay, so moving on. This is a picture of my father on the left pre-war Japan with his brother Yakub and our house in Ashigawa, which was in between Kobe and Osaka. So while like David was talking, most of the foreigners lived in Kobe, worked in Osaka. And then there were some of us that lived in the suburbs in between Kobe and Osaka in Japanese houses. And this was ours. And you can see how every night all the wooden doors were closed. And then later in the morning were open. Um, people were afraid of rheumatism. Somehow evening air, damp air, whatever. So here we go. So this, this is, you know, right after the war. 
and foreigners, and obviously we we're foreigners, forever foreigners, um, had rations. And this is my mother's on top. My corn, my corn, my my pot. Pardon? And then on the side here, this is um, an ad from an Egyptian newspaper in 1953. And for my father's company, him and his brother, it was called Wamje. And I still have this, I took this picture because I still have this little um, espresso cup, a Turkish coffee cup. This is a kafia he used to make and export to the Gulf states. And they exported everything from tablecloths, um, obviously kafias, dinner sets, um, sheets, everything. But it was becoming harder and harder, not only because he was a small businessman, but because now he had no passport. Egypt did not renew his passport. By mid 50s, he had no passport. And it was very, very, very hard to do business. And let me tell you a little story here about uh, in 50, 52, we were almost going to be rich. And um, the uh, Saudis had heard of my dad and, and the textiles, and they wanted uh, army uniforms that they, uh, according American... GI issue uniforms for the Saudis. And they asked my dad if they, you know, through, through, through agents, could he make the exact same? And dad, dad was like, well, I can't do exact, but I can do exactly similar. And he was so proud till his dying day that he thought of exactly similar. So he said, yes, made the uniforms, through the help of actually names you know, uh, Nomura Trading Company, these were all small, small time getting getting over World War II, you know, just rebuilding Japan. And Toyota, who gave him sewing machines, and dad filled a warehouse with sewing machines, made, I don't know, over 100 or 120, 150 uh, uniforms for the Saudis, and since dad couldn't travel to Saudi Arabia for two reasons, one, he's a Jew. Secondly, he had no passport. So he sent his Japanese employee to Saudi Arabia. Uh, the guy goes there. He says, but you know, let me tell you, um, Musa Wahba is an Israeli Jew. Now he had to stick Israeli and even though we were not Israeli, just to get his point across, Jew wasn't enough, Israeli Jew, boom. The business went to the employee, came back, we were out of, out of business. So dad worked for other companies um, and then eventually an American company um, and did much better. But it was sad because he loved, loved uh, um, inventing things and doing business. And at any rate, that was over. He could no longer invent his own mark. And here, a little pictures about being Jews in Japan. So that's my dad. And did you see the tourist scroll was an Ashkenazi scroll without the, the, um, the box that the Spardim had. This is David's dad, Mr. Moshe, Victor Moshe. And um, you see in the back, the, 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 the soldier. So this is during the Korean War. So this is in the fifties, and um, eventually they actually had a box made, and the synagogue became pretty much. I mean, they were Ashkenazim in the synagogue, but it was basically a Sephardic synagogue with the Syrians and the Iraqis fighting, and 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 Mr. Gottlieb. Uh, a Russian Jew who was very pivotal in the community, wanting his, you know, place in there. And um, we were an extended family. There's no two ways about it because people's families were all over the world. And so our community, no matter what squabbles, no matter what was going on, had to get along, which is interesting when I think about in this day and age, where if you vote for this person, that one won't talk to you. And you know this one won't talk to you and you lose friends. We couldn't lose friends. There was no losing friends. There was no losing community. 
you had to get along. So within the, our small Jewish community, people got along and um, within the family, tried to get along. So here's my picture of or our family. Um, as you can see, some people have a, a napkin on their heads because there's no, there was no kippa available for everybody or they didn't bring their kippa, but it was obviously probably Passover because I don't remember us having so many people around for Shabbat. So it was probably a Passover celebration. My brother and I and long time um, families here. Again, all Iraqi except for my dad. And we spoke Judeo-Arabic in the house. Um, when people ask me, what was your language? It was hybrid. It was, you know, my parents were raised in, in um, Arabic and French, and then they learned Hindi, they learned Japanese, it kept adding languages. And so our English initially was very British English, to switch it over to American English, there was, we were chameleons, we were changing all the time. This is, um, now I have to say my parents had fun. The 50s, they had a blast. They had parties and parties and they got together and they, you know, this, this on the picture on the left, um, uh, they were, there's Mrs. Schweke's in there, my mom, pillars of the community, my dad. Um, they, they just, we all partied, the kids, the kids were somewhere else. We were all, we were together and it was a very cohesive community. Um, the little Jewish community lived in, within the big Japanese community and surrounded by the international community. And we also had to get along with the international community, whether we liked it or not. And uh, here we go with some synagogue events. And I don't know, David, if David, you're in here somewhere, but your siblings sure are. And um, there's, um, I'm on the right and David's sister Helena on the left. And we both got to be Queen Esther, we shared it. It was very, very, very thrilling. And he, he, since Kobe was a port city, every year there was a float and Israel was represented even though we had no Israelis at the time with children. I don't even know if we had Israelis, but we didn't have Israelis to put on the float. So all the Jewish girls got to be on the float and took uh, turns eventually becoming the flower princess. So what you have here are, you know, we were a very diverse community. There's a Russian Jew, there's a Syrian Jew, there's another Syrian Jew, there's an American Jew from Brooklyn and myself. And um, it was wonderful. You went through the, the town and people were screaming, Israel, Israel, wow, Israel. And it, it was amazing because to get such a positive reaction around being Jews in Israel, when um, in school, and I will tell that story soon, it was a whole other story. This is our neighborhood. My uncle was always bringing in from the black market cars. And um, we had a, looks like what, a Buick, I don't know. And there's my brother, myself and our neighborhood friends. Unlike the kids in Kobe, we um, interacted on a daily basis with the Japanese friends because we had to take the train to go to Kobe and the train to go to school and the train to go to the synagogue. So, um, it was it was a it was wonderful to be so immersed with the Japanese culture and you know actually across the street from here was a bombed out house we lived right by bombed out houses that we would use for the walls as chalk on the street uh, we lived quite and ran on the river but then always longing for Kobe, which is where the foreigners were. This is um, an, a, a shot of a matchstick box where my brother was featured. So we were both, we were foreigners. We were always aware we were foreigners. At times, 
we were thought of as exotic and can we can I take a picture and other times we suffered slurs it's just how it was and you could live in Japan for many 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 years there was one foreigner Sam Evans who eventually got a Japanese passport I don't know how and why but we were there 20 years and there was no way to get any passport now the the part of being stateless was that there were two schools and um there was an, a missionary school the canadian academy which was not there to convert you it was there to educate their children and then there was the catholic school that i went to for nine years and the cath from kindergarten through eighth grade and the Catholic school was there to convert you. And usually, well, most of my years there, I was the only Jew in my class. So it was incredibly difficult. And, um, and being stateless, you know, there was no backup. And so there was just like, you're a Jew. You know, you're not a, a, a this Jew or that Jew, you're a Jew. Can't even say Egyptian or Iraqi because we didn't have passports anymore. So I was, I stuck out as the Jew. And I, in when I was very young in third grade, and I also spoke back, which made things difficult. So in third grade, one of the nuns, the, actually the one I loved the most, came over to me and, and, and took me over to the crucifix and said, look, look. Look what it says. It says, Jesus, King of the Jews. Why don't you accept him as your Lord and Savior? And I'm like, if he was a Jew, why do I have to convert? Okay, punishment. So we, we go through many, many years, and I reach this age on the right, where I'm older, and I we have a history book report to do. And I'm thinking, okay, I got to do something. I've always been an activist. I've got to do something to teach them that all this Jew hate ends up in something terrible because I had just come across a used copy in a secondhand bookstore on my way home from school on the Holocaust. And I read this book on the Holocaust when I was in seventh grade and gave the book report. And I really thought that it would make a change. And I thought if they knew the extent of you kill Jesus, you kill Jesus, you're this, you're that, you know, um, Jews are bad. This is what it leads to. And instead, um, right before I got to my seat, a girl, a classmate, and again, as I said earlier, we had to get, get along. This classmate and I were together from first grade on. And the classmate was half Japanese and half German. Her father was a Nazi who had to, who basically chose to stay in Japan, got married um, to a Japanese woman and had this daughter. And as I'm walking back to my seat, Helga says, well, you know, my father said Hitler built good roads for Germany. And I thought I would hear, yeah, but look what else he did that didn't happen what happened was the conversation uh centered around well would he go to heaven or would he go to hell if at the last minute he converted and the consensus was that he would go to heaven if he was sincerely repentant at the last minute but the jews would always suffer events like the Holocaust, and we would never go to heaven until we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Well, fortunately, my father had a good enough job by then, and I got out and went and had actually the most wonderful four years that I spent in Japan um, in my high school, the Canadian Academy, because like I said, they were not there to convert you. They were there to educate you. And a lot of the children there were children whose parents were converting Japanese people or having hospitals and schools and so forth all over the rest of the Japan. And then they would send their children to our school and us local people, um, businessmen's children would go to the school and we would pay very, very 
um, expensive tuition to cover the missionary tuition. So this was graduation. And um, from graduation, the next picture is my Red Cross papers. Oops, sorry. My Red Cross papers to get to the United States. It's quite a mugshot. Um, and I had two years. They, they it was it was good for two years, and um, I pretty much got the message from my family that I had two years to find a husband, because they still didn't have immigration, and because my dad was an Egyptian national, the United States did not have open immigration. We didn't have family in the United States. And um, what can I say? It took them 20 years. So I got to the United States and then found a husband, returned to Japan and had a wedding in the same synagogue that got, I don't know, did they tear, I suppose they tore down the synagogue and remade it. So this was our original synagogue. And um, David's father was a, the, a very learned man and we had no rabbi. And he's the one who basically married us. And what you see on this other side is my re-entry visa to get to Japan to get married, which was also a huge hassle because in Japan, our experience was, so when are you leaving? And they would say to my dad, when are you leaving? And he says, ask Nasser, you know, give us a passport, we will leave. It made them nervous to have foreigners without a nation to, to go to, even though we had Israel. Our the rest of our family that were all kicked out from Iraq and, and Egypt at the time, 56 on, 51 and 56, they were living in the Maba Road and then they were having a terrible time. So we were not going to make Aliyah and go live in Israel. We were gonna wait for America. That was a thing, just waiting for America. At any rate, so I went to college in LA and I'm like, yay, I found a husband, I'm getting married, going back to Japan because my parents are still there, the community is still there, getting married in the synagogue of my childhood thinking that that would just be a cakewalk. Well, I barely got to my wedding in time because the Japanese consulate in Los Angeles, where I was living, said, we, we, don't, we, we can't just you know, give you a re-entry visa. You might not leave. And I'm like, I'm leaving. Truly, I am leaving. And um, it says over here in Japanese stateless, um, they grilled me and grilled me and grilled me. And then they said, maybe. Maybe we will, we will give you papers, which they did. And um, I got to the US, whoops. Yes, so I got to the US and um, lived happily ever after. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it, my, my um, childhood, made me an activist. My childhood made me somebody who un really understands anti-Semitism and understands that we need Israel. And even though we didn't go to Israel, it was always there. And um, that we are a people and we are people from all over the diaspora and we can't take Israel for granted. And so that my blogs are, pretty much about that and about Israel and being Jews and what that means. And um, yeah, so this is my very personal story. And I have to tell you, it was really hard to go back and look at all these pictures because they're cool, they're cool pictures, but the stories behind them were difficult. Thank you so much, Rachel. I think that, that was a wonderful journey uh, through memory lane. <laughs> uh, just the question is, was it ever possible to become a Japanese citizen? 
you know, you'd let you'd spent all these years in Japan. Why why couldn't it happen? David might know that answer better. I just know they didn't do it. You just didn't get to. You were a foreigner. You were a gaijin. You were a foreigner, and you weren't supposed to stay. Well, you're not supposed to stay there. Dependent on how long you were there and how you got that statement. Hey. Sorry, come here. Can you hear me now? Can yeah. you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. It depended on uh, how long and what happened to and how you got that stateless status. So I think my father had the option but didn't want to. And uh, someone like Valentine Morozov, they did become they did become Japanese. I mean, he, he was a strapping, good looking <laughs> Russian guy with a Japanese passport. Yeah. Did he become Japanese? Yeah. They were also waiting for U.S. immigration and kept, you know, going. But generally, you didn't get to. Yeah. Because if we could have, we would have. And my parents were there 20 years. So there was no passport. Mm. And I, could, I couldn't yeah. get a passport. And David, you showed um, your father's passport, Iraqi passport. Yes. Uh, and then that was voided, wasn't it? I mean, right. It, it was it, renewed. It was, yeah. Yeah. It was renewed yeah. when he went back to Iraq after the war, got married, and they came back to Japan in 49. And when he sent his passport to Tokyo to get renewed, they said they were not going to renew it. And that's when he bought the Panamanian citizenship, which is another story. <laughs> another yes. story. Okay. But that's because you were an Iraqi national outside Iraq, and automatically you uh, you had to forfeit your nationality. And, Is that right? right? And and yeah. Jewish, correct? And yeah. Jewish, yeah. Of course, all Jews lost their nationality. Wow, what a story! Uh, shall we have a look at the questions in the chat? Um, can either of you see the questions? Are there any questions that you would like to answer? Well, somebody just asked, is there a Jewish community in Kobe now? And I answered, yes. <clears throat> there's, a, there's a Chabad rabbi, Vyshitsky. He's been there for several years. He's the brother-in-law of the Chabad rabbi of Tokyo. And uh, one of the main, what happened was that when a lot of the older residents left, there was a young man by the name of, uh, this escapes me, from New, New Zealand, he, Bruce Benson. He came to Japan to study judo, and while he was there, he he, he organized the first Maccabea team from Japan. But uh, what he did, he wasn't religious. He was teaching English and studying judo in Nara. And then when everybody left, for some reason or another, he used to come to the synagogue from time to time. He, in fact, said he would come more often if there was a keg at the synagogue. So he, so they told him, yeah, sure, bring in a keg. So they brought in the keg, and he would spend all afternoon at the synagogue on Shabbat. And um, when everybody left, he sort of took on the role of... Uh, you know, managing the synagogue. I remember he used to call my father all the time. My father had already been in New York. He used to call him all the time. You know, we had somebody passed away. What do I do? And my father would lead him through the instructions. There was a small Jewish cemetery up in Futatabi. And um, and uh, he ran the synagogue until one day he decided, and he we talked about it, um, about how to uh, support the synagogue once he left. And uh, one of the interesting things is that when the synagogue was, the new synagogue was built in 1970, they built a mikvah for the community as, to, as opposed to private mikvot, uh, one in our home and one in the Ben David's home. Um, and uh, as a result, between the mikvah and the apartment above the synagogue that they used to rent, they helped cover, uh, excuse me, cover the costs of maintenance of the synagogue. And um, Part of the deal that Ben, that Bruce Benson made, was that if the Chabad rabbis would send a rabbi at their expense, we would put uh, he would put them up at the at the apartment in the in the synagogue. So that's how the community basically has survived since then. And of course, the young Israelis that come through and the occasional traveler is very very occasional now. Not like in the old days when Japan was a a major supply source for 
manufactured goods as well as you know pearls cultured pearls which is a big business for kobe um so that that has uh you know it's not quite as active as it was anymore but judy brown davis says her grandson had his brit in the uh in the shul in uh kobe almost 11 years ago well that's that is amazing um yeah and uh, susan diamond asks did any refugees marry japanese did you know of any marry japanese probably not or, or did, did any jews uh, well jews yes not not refugees i don't think no. <laughs> but there were a lot of, there were one of the saddest things was the, the number of israelis that married japanese young <laughs> japanese women yeah. oh, i mean recently right i mean like in the since we left uh, yeah. even before it's hot ofek married a, a japanese woman uh elias zilcha uh, oh, he was a, yeah he so, was a he was a kohen and he married a japanese yeah. woman the no there are the few yeah. Sa, my brother sam might know a few more he, i know he, he must be listening rabbi in london rabbi berger yes married, yes that's right but i think in london he in found london, a, but she converted uh, yeah. orthodox conversion and uh, Vera asks, in what ways did aspects of Japanese culture influence your own in music or in cuisine? Um, in my house, my mom loved cooking, so she would like cook Japanese food as well. But I just wanted Indian and Arabic food and then American. <laughs> <laughs> so we would have bamya once a week we had to have bamya because i was insisted but my brother wanted japanese food so she would make all kinds of you know teppanyaki and uh, just sukiyaki and japanese food and i would like complain about that because why can't we have spaghetti but it was just you know yeah we did have japanese food and after school we would stop in and um the fast food noodle shops because we were not kosher so um you know the 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 story was that well you had to be you had to have money to be kosher in japan because you'd have to import your meat first of all or i don't know you guys had somebody my father. my father my father killed the chickens yeah, yeah. They, yeah my mother said no no when we get to the united states we'll be kosher and then of course we got to the united states and she's like yeah no <laughs> um so <laughs> we were not kosher so we went and we ate in in the japanese restaurants and the noodle shops and um hung out i spoke japanese fluently you know just um we hung out with you know like in in coffee shops and like when i was very young all my friends are japanese but we always had that that interface. Mm -hmm. And like I said, one person might find you like a beautiful exotic foreigner, somebody else will call you a slur. So you never knew what you were gonna get. Right, so thank you to Mark who says one refugee he knows of, Joseph Shimkin married a Japanese woman and stayed in Tokyo. And William Clarence Smith said there were a number of POWs from the Russo Japanese war who married Japanese women, presumably not, not Jews. <laughs> hi, hi, William. <laughs> you know, what generally happened is like Zilcha, who David mentioned, um, Zilcha was an Iraqi and um, he was an anti-Zionist. And so our community was very pro-Israel. And so he didn't hang around long um, in the community. And when he married a Japanese woman that he didn't convert to Judaism because there was one close friend of ours who married a Japanese woman and he converted and she converted to Judaism. So that kept him within. But the people that did not convert to, to Judaism, did not have their wives convert, kind of disappeared into, I don't know where, Tokyo, Osaka, but not in this community mm. yeah i apologize to william yes they were japanese pow's and their wives sometimes converted and kept the kosher household very interesting yeah there is a question from lawrence about what about anti-semitism in japan today do either of you know what the situation is today don't no. um i 
I think the the issue with anti-Semitism in Japan is um, is there until the founding until the Six Day War and maybe a little bit after that there was really no understanding of what Israel was as a you know small little nation. Uh, the Arab boycott was an issue because the Jap many of the Japanese conglomerates did not do business with Israel solely because of the Arab boycott. That was this was back in the in the late sixties and seventies. Uh, when the oil crisis emerged. Um, today, I think, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're more educated, they're more, they're more knowledgeable, but I, I just don't experience, and I've never experienced anti-Semitism in Japan, not now and not in my business career and uh, even now in any of my dealings with Japanese. I don't know, my brother, Sam, uh, is a dentist in New York, uh, and he caters to the Japanese practice. I don't know, Sam. Where, if you're if you're listening still, you know, maybe you might want to chat, enter in the chat room what you what you experience with the Japanese. But yeah. you didn't experience anti-Semitism in your Christian uh, school. Yo, your... yeah, I did not ex ex uh, experience anti-Semitism at all from the Japanese. It was just being a foreigner and gaijin was a pejorative and I was a dark skinned foreigner. So I was a Kurombo foreigner, which is a blackie foreigner. Um, and only in the school, which was <laughs> nine, <laughs> nine years, but it was the school was very intense. I mean, it was medieval. Mm. Yeah, it wasn't today's Catholic school. It was a very different vibe then. And and that was bad. That was, uh, you know, very, very difficult. So a question from Little Mermaid. Does anyone know where the Russian Jewish soldiers who fought in the Russian-Japanese war in Manchuria are buried? Hmm. Don't know if that's... I, that I don't know. That's the professor on the call might know. Uh, okay. I'm, wonder, I'm wondering, um, David, if you can say something about the deportation of the Jews to Shanghai. I mean, what, what were the conditions uh, like for them during the war? Um, what happened to yeah. them? That so I, I, the conditions in Japan obviously were much better than they were in Shanghai. In Shanghai, there was thousands of people uh, cramped into a very, very small area of the foreign settlement. And with a, with a number growing, I think, every day, because people were coming to Shanghai, not only from Japan, people were coming to Shanghai on boats from Europe. And uh, so I think as bad and as difficult as things were in Japan, um, I think they were better than in Shanghai. And, you know, deportation, like, it's it's really a tough word to use, not that I'm sympathetic to the Japanese, but if you think about the Japanese, you know, everything goes by the book. If it's checked off, it's good. If it's not checked off, it's not good. So if they have a transit visa and they're getting off the boat in Tsuruga and they get checked off for the $200 from Thomas Cook, they get checked off as having a forward, uh, forward uh, destination to go to, and they get checked off that they're going to Kobe where they're going to be supported for the next two weeks while they're there, that's what the Japanese basically went by, you know, and uh, and then they and then they were going to be sent to Shanghai. <clears throat> Even that was delayed with the intervention of a family member of the imperial family, who was uh, Dr. Kosuji, who was sympathetic to the Jews and studied Hebrew and had some interaction with the rabbis of the refugee group from the Mir Yeshiva that came. So uh, no, I think they did what they could. They extended as much as they could. And at some point, they, they just sent everybody off to uh, Shanghai. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um... So, uh, yes, uh, Gary says he's never been, never experienced anti-Semitism in Japan and he's been there several times. Um, and uh, uh, Lonnie asks, are there Jews in other cities in Japan and what is the uh, total number of Jews living in Japan currently? Would you know that? I can I tell you what, what we experienced early uh... What I experienced in having gone back and worked in Japan from 80 to 87, 
um, during the holidays, uh, you know, we would have people come out of the woodwork. You know, they would be working, teaching in the uh, in the Inaka in the deep countryside. Uh, they would be they would not be in mainstream cities or in the larger cities, and they would come out. They had no connection with the community until the holiday, whether it was Pesach or uh, or uh, Rosh Hashanah Kippur. And um, so I don't know whether we could ever get a good count. The community in Kobe was small. The community in Tokyo today is much larger. There are expatriates working for uh, U.S. companies, U.S. investment banks and brokerage firms and banks. Uh, so there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of uh, temporary residents. Uh, Japan is not a cheap place to have an office anymore. So the excitement about op opening offices in Japan is not as uh, much as it was back in, let's say, the 19, nine, late 1980s and 1990s. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, William Clarence Smith says, if you exclude POWs and refugees, there were about a thousand Jews before World War II, though some sources claim more. In all of Japan, is that right? In all of Japan, I believe, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So um, there's a question about um, was their consciousness um, well a bit difficult to uh, to answer that question I think um, Audrey Shira Cohen says her father escaped Germany and was one of the last uh, one of the last refugees to to arrive in Shanghai and once the Japanese soldiers entered Shanghai the Jews were put in ghettos and uh her honor was given special privileges as she was the seamstress to the emperor and his wife how fascinating is that hmm. this is the beauty about having these conversations everybody has a different experience of the war or you know their family's life and so on so i mean i see the question about protocols of zion i mean those books aren't really uh interesting for um uh, well, maybe maybe Dr. Professor Smith would like to correct me. Interesting for uh, for people for Japanese to study as philosophy books uh, to adopt and the philosophy to adopt. Uh, I think it's more out of just interest of what the of that world thinks. Uh, that's that's been my experience. Nobody, I don't think uh, there was no interest of the Japanese to support, well, I won't say no, but I would say there was hardly any interest of the Japanese to port, support the German agenda in Japan. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's evidenced by the fact, at least in Kobe, where they had uh, minimal, minimal presence. Okay. Well, I think um, we've been going for almost um, an hour and a half and um, um, it's probably time to wrap up. Uh, we will save the chat for you because there's some very interesting comments. Uh, and um, it just remains for me really to thank you so much, David. And thank you so much, Rachel, for a, a wonderful, I think we got a real taste of what it was like um to live in japan to be a jew in japan and i think you did it very well thank you very much for respecting the time constraints i know it was difficult <laughs> uh and and thank you to everyone who joined us uh for this just to say that um our program really resumes in september uh, when there will be a talk on the Sassoons of Lechworth. And this is the only branch of the Sassoon family that actually remained Jewish. And in fact, they were very observant, uh, very Orthodox Jews. So do join us for that. Uh, I think it's on the 5th of September. There are two in-person events, um, one in, in uh, August, which is a conference on Aden, uh, not much use to those of you in, in the States or Canada, I'm afraid. There's also an in-person premiere of a film on Tunisia. All the details are on the Harif website. 
And if uh, you've got all the adverts coming up now. Yeah, and we have a commercial break. And after that, we will be able to unmute everybody, as is our custom. I unmute everybody who's Except, given their name. If yeah. you're iPad or <laughs> iPhone or user, I'm afraid I'm going to take you out of the meeting, I'm afraid. <laughs> okay, so these are the Sassoons of Letchworth. Oh, great stuff. Hi, so, sorry about that. Lynn knocked the power plug out of her laptop and it's ran out of power. <laughs> Um, so she's going to come and join yeah. me. Hello. So, um, yeah. So just to wrap up, uh, I think you've seen the commercials. Yeah, no, and, I, I, um, I just want to go through and remove people. Yeah. And you will be unmuted shortly and you'll be able to say goodbye or thank you. In fact, everyone who shouldn't be there has actually vanished, which is absolutely fantastic. Okay. So unmute everybody. Yeah, this one's good. And there you said that. Right. OK, everyone can now unmute themselves. So if you do want to say something just in an orderly fashion. <laughs> can I ask a question? Can you hear? Yes. Uh, how is it, Rachel, that your name is Wahba? I lived in Egypt and Wahba for me was an Egyptian Coptic name. Um, Wahba is actually an Egyptian Muslim, Coptic, and Jews also have it. We were, my father's family, his paternal side were in Egypt for like thousands of years. So it might have been something else at one point, but we've always known ourselves as Wahbas, and they were cousins in a village that was populated by a lot of Jewish Wahbas, and uh, yeah. It's a it's an Egyptian name, but yes, cops and Muslims and Jews have it. Interesting. It's my my sister's best friend was uh, was Wahba, and she was Egyptian cop. That's why I, I asked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a very common Egyptian name. Can I add something to that? Yeah, Alan. Yeah, this is Alan Farhi. Uh, Rachel, uh, nice to see you again. Uh, I just want to mention two things. Uh, I have worked this week or this month on a Wahba family uh, that married Levi, Jose, and Mashish. They were from Benha. And of course, you know that I always try to link the different Wahba. My, my uncle, my, the husband of my maternal uh, sister uh, is Wahba related to you, Rachel, as you know. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm trying to find that and they will be on the website at this month end. And if you want, maybe I can share it to you privately, uh, Rachel, to see if you can see any names. Uh, for those who live in London, I will be in London the, the, the last week in July at the, at the conference. And if you give me your email, we'll try to get together. Yeah, Alan, do you have Lynn's email? <laughs> I think so. We'll, we'll be in London. I think, I think Lynn's email. Oh, no, I'm coming. I'm coming. This is the genealogical conference, which is being held in London. Yeah, so actually, I'm disappearing. I, I'm going to turn off the blur background. Uh, the, uh... Yeah, sorry. Okay. Now, look forward to seeing you in London, Alain, and all the other genealogists on, on the call. <laughs> yeah, we shall be there. We shall be there. Yes. Yeah. Wahba, by the way, is really a big family from Benha in the Egyptian Delta. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank I you. Can leave this. <laughs> is that Jacob? Yes, it's me. Yes. Oh, nice, nice. nice to. I'll email you all soon. Yes, thank you. Nice to e meet. <laughs> yeah, do we have anyone on the call from Japan? I saw there were some people from Okinawa yes. and elsewhere. Perhaps if someone from Japan would yeah. like to comment. Well, there's Yossi. Is Yossi still awake? 
Is it still, is it Yossi still? in Tokyo, are you still there? Well, it's about three in the morning or maybe even four. No, Yossi is, <laughs> and Okinawa was also there, someone from uh, Okinawa. Somebody from Okinawa, wow. Okinawa, would you like to speak? Hello? Hello, uh, Okinawa. I, I do have a lot of uh, Sephardim who lived or died or worked in Japan. The, the, a lot of them. There are some uh, Elion, Antaki, and uh, you have, I have a very long list of Japanese residents on my website. Uh, I, also, I also know that a personal friend of mine uh, spent 13 years in Japan. Uh, his father was uh, the uh, MGM uh, representative in uh, Tokyo. So, uh, and also I have another Carmona who married, who was a French diplomat. Uh, this is more recent. Uh, he married two Japanese ladies. And now he <laughs> lives in France. I mean, not at the same time, successively. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been bigger me. And yeah. I think I think we also have some distinguished academics on the call. If any of them would like to speak, um, can I do a little? Um, yes. This is the, the, the new book by Rotem, edited by Rotem Kauner on Jews of modern Asia. Oh. And, uh, Rotem and I have got a chapter on Jews in Japan in that book. It's just come out. It's, right. is, is that Professor Clarence Smith? Yeah. So is this it? is Jewish communities in modern Asia. Okay. Must buy. <laughs> right. Isn't that wonderful? Well, if, if you send Lynn a review copy, she'll write you a very nice review. <laughs> I'll tell Mabruk, Rachel. Mabruk. <laughs> wonderful. How did you become interested, Professor, in, in this topic? Um, I've forgotten. <laughs> but I've worked on different diasporas. Uh, so I've worked on Jews in the Philippines quite a lot, too. Um, who were can can different... we have a lecture? <laughs> uh, Jews in the Philippines, yes. yes. Yeah. 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 Because Hopefully there were very, different sort of communities. There were a lot of um, uh, Judeo Spanish or Judeo Iberian speaking Jews from Anatolia who I'd never, I'd hardly found in Japan at all. Um, so I'm, I'm not quite sure why in the Philippines and Japan the community was fairly different. There was not much connection between the Philippine community and Japan, except for a couple of Syrian families. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, it was some Syrians. The interesting thing is they went there for, went from Turkey to the Philippines and not direct from Spain to the Philippines in 1492. Oh. Um, there, were, well, there were people who, were, who converted to Catholicism, um, whether really or not, of course, is a difficult question to answer. And they were in Japan as well. So, so I, I would love a lecture on on the Jews of Philippines uh, of the Philippines. So, so you're on, you're on, Professor. Okay. <laughs> I will be in touch. Right. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Okay. So I just wanted to make the point because you know um, I think all the Iraqis and the Syrians had one branch of the family that was running the business, um, you know, in Japan, there's one in Japan, one in India, one in, in Europe, uh, one in Manchester. Uh, and so it wouldn't have been that uncommon um, for everybody really to have, to have some relative, um, you know, living there, or working there. What, what do you think? There were certainly, I mean, they were in China as well, of course. Um, yeah, yeah. What I find strange is the way in which the Mizrahi Jews uh, sort of are in different concentrations in different places. So you mm. get Iraqis much more prominent in some places, Syrians much more in others. Mm. Um, and Rachel was talking a little bit about tensions between Syrians and Iraqi in, in the synagogue. I thought that was quite interesting. <laughs> yeah, there were a lot of tensions. <laughs> what about though? I mean, power. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Also, everybody wanted to say. Everybody wanted to say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Does, does anyone else want to say something before we wrap up? Uh, uh, yes, I have an anecdote about uh, the tension between the Iraqis and the Halabis. From Aleppo. Go ahead. 
In Israel, once a very clever man was asked uh, how he can uh, uh, explain the difference between the Iraqi Ba'ath Party and the Syrian Ba'ath Party, which were in a big, big clash between themselves. And the, he was asked how it comes. He, he told them, look at the Iraqi contingent and the Syrian contingent is an Israeli broadcasting association which speaks in Arabic. See what words they have there. So you'll understand why there are tensions between the Ba'athists of Iraq and Syria. <laughs> That's a bit Thank you for Jerusalem. <laughs> right, Lynn is now back in her own right. Okay. Holly, would you like to say something? Yes, as usual, Lawrence and Lynn, thank you for the superb presentation. David and Rachel, thank you. This was, this was so fascinating. And I want to ask you, Rachel, what happens if a girl can't find a suitable husband for love or convenience in two years for your visa? Does that mean you're stuck in Japan? It, it would have. I mean, you know, my, <laughs> my father um, sort of warned me. He said, you know, there's a nice uh, Israeli business uh, coming now to Tokyo. I'm like, whoops, I better find somebody fast. Oh my God. <laughs> in America. <laughs> Yes, it would have meant I would be back in Japan. And then, uh, you know, my parents eventually did get, get their immigration visa. Their number came up. Um, so we would have gone to the U.S., but it, I probably would have been married off. Yeah. <laughs> Can I just ask? Well, first of all, thank you all. It was fabulous. And I just wanted to ask, Rachel, where do you live in L.A.? Because I'm also here in L.A. Where did uh, where my um when I uh, I was put on an airplane, and landed in Los Angeles and uh, went to Valley State, which is now Cal State Northridge. Oh, okay, okay, I'm in Peter Robertson area. Uh, okay, so that was, yeah, that that's uh, where. Come here, come here, darling. <laughs> what is it? I just want to say, we <laughs> just arrived in California as well. Ah, okay, we've just okay. arrived. Have we? Oh, so we have. There's the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, <laughs> oh, fabulous. <laughs> I mean, I have, excuse me, I have to say this. Yeah. When we were growing up in Japan, everybody was in love with Rachel. So what? all this, all this BS about not being able to find somebody in two years, they were, I'm sure there are a lot of guys knocking. <laughs> so we know yeah, all you. these little guys that you never paid attention to were crazy about you yeah okay are you just finding out now rachel <laughs> the not, truth will out anyway on that rather nice note thank you all. say good night and um, thank you again Rachel, thank, thank you. you again, David. That was fun. Thank, thank you all you so for much. joining us. And we hope to see you again soon. I would encourage all the people, it's the first time they've joined our talks, come again. They're, I can't promise it will be quite as good as this one, but they're all pretty good. <laughs> of course, they're all thank pretty you. good. They are. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Okay. Thank and we're you. still crazy you. about you, Rachel and David. Come thank back you very again. much. Thanks. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye.